Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's Ingenta webinar. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me. Uh, today's webinar is going to be with you know, which is going to be about increasing content discoverability using AI technology. AI is an increasingly vital part of academic research with over a million scholarly articles published every year. It is impossible for those working even in niche fields to keep up to date with what is really relevant and to not miss out on content which might be of key importance. This situation is ex exacerbated by the rising tide of open access content. AI supported searching is increasingly the only means of painlessly unearthing those vital articles. You know Discover is an essential tool for librarians and their patrons looking across entire collections and helping expose the full value within holdings. The system creates a topical hierarchy and automatically updates when other new concepts are introduced, enabling AI driven searching. You know Unearth is an important tool of libraries and content creators to get a more granular understanding of their own content. You know's AI technology will read a publisher's content corpus, providing topics, subtopics, and concepts for a deeper under, understanding and taxonomy. Ingenta is delighted to be working together with you know, a collaboration which brings its publisher's valuable content to an even wider audience. Our guest pre presenter uh, today is Manisha Bellina, you know's senior sales manager for Europe. She has extensive experience in the STM scholarly publishing industry having held senior positions within BioOne and Publishers Communication Group. I will now pass you over to Manisha and hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Manisha. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction, Mike. Um, so today I'm going to um, give you um, a very quick rundown about really uh, the landscape of, of AI and um, how we are really dealing with a lot of information and how we want to better manage this information, especially as librarians and, um, and as well as publishers. Um, and then we'll talk about how we um, manage that using artificial intelligence through uh, you know, um, and I will talk a little bit about you know in terms of introducing the company and also um, about our raison d'etre. Um, I'll also I'll keep the slides short, um, but then I'll move straight into a live demonstration of how um, you know Discover works. Um, it is a um, concept-based search engine, um, so we're not here to compete with other discovery tools like Primo or um, EBSCO Discovery, etc. You know this is working in collaboration with these um, organisations. Um, and then I will uh, touch upon something that we do with uh, publishers or, or content curators um, to use the same technology to get a, a much deeper understanding of their own content, which is called, um, you know, on Earth. So um, if you have any questions, obviously, please put it through to the chat um, and then I'll answer questions at the end um, just to make life a bit easier. OK, so here we are today. We've been, we live in an environment where there's just too much information. Information is, you know, easily available in our hand through our mobile desire, uh, devices, better and faster than there ever has been before. And it's really trying to understand, e even as a, as a librarian, um, as a publisher, or even as a researcher, as a patron of a research um, organisation, how we're going to really consume all this large amount of information and really turn it into something which is more useful right for our research so turning that information into knowledge and as you can see the data volumes are consistently exploding um, and there's going to be more and more uh, data um, um, going to be um, uh, the data output is just going to be um, exponentially increasing um, throughout throughout the years and if we think about um, um, uh, libraries. Libraries are driven by their uh, research output, the results that they get. This, the, the, that's how their grants and and um, their rankings. Uh, rankings are also um, uh, delivered through the research output that they provide. So we're all feeding into this. Publishers are have have more access to better technologies and better systems to um, increase the output they're doing. On, on that side. So we really want to be um, in an environment where we turn this information into knowledge. Otherwise, it's absolutely useless to us. So this is really what uh, UNO is about. It's about trying to 
provide um, researchers and institutions an environment where they can really use this information in a new way rather than um, and going beyond the discovery tool that, they, that they've got. So we're really all about getting this information and turning it into knowledge so that we can progress and, and do things with it. And the only way that we can really do that in, in the best ways possible is also to understand the, hum, the way the human mind works. So when, the, when as, um, as you know, we are always consuming so much information all the time, but if we think about something when we're reading it, we read it, we understand it, and we also um, automatically generate connections, inferences, and relationships between different things that we read um, and consume all the time. So if we can um, understand how the human brain works, then maybe we need to look, uh, employ some of that what um, some of that understanding using artificial intelligence, so we are able to consume all this information that we have around us and um, that's going to be generated in the future to really turn that into, into something more useful to us. So this is where we believe we've created something that's going to solve some of that problem. So you know really wasn't um, as an organization founded by a few guys thinking yeah let's make a company no that's that's not how it happened it actually was more um serendipitous i suppose in in the manner that it was founded so our founder he was actually a researcher a phd researcher at king's college london um and he was studying a, a phd in econophysics um and he was looking at um the way ai could be used um, to read large amounts of data in the area of financial cycles um, and taking and extrapolating um, data from structured and unstructured um, um, avenues and processing it by using artificial intelligence, intelligence to see the relationships between um, different sources so that you could make better and more informed decisions when, when you knew um, what the relationships were. So he'd created this algorithm which enabled him to read large amounts of data um, through a program um, in the area of econophysics. This was then actually developed further at a biotech company. So the same algorithm was used for life sciences in the area of drug repurposing in Switzerland. Um, so the uh, algorithm was then reading 23 million full text articles and publications in the area of drug repurposing. So, you know, how um, certain drug, if drugs affect certain maladies and, and what the relationships are between those and where you can find that information um, written within scholarly articles or research pro papers, as well as um, patents and clinical trials and things like that. And that was very much in the area of rare diseases. Um, but as you may know, the area of rare disease is a pretty underfunded area of science. So technology took a bit of a, um, a halt there. But then as it happened, um, one of the, um, I believe one of the people that was on the board of this uh, biotech company was actually the vice provost, um, whose name is Professor Mike Keller. Um, uh, and Professor Mike Keller is also the uh, head librarian, uh, library director at Stanford University. He saw this technology and he thought, actually, this could be used across the entire spectrum of academia. So to empower researchers to the next level, because this is something that we really don't have right now in the library is a tool that you can provide to go beyond keyword based searching. So he um, so then this algorithm was developed further. The technology was incubated at Stanford University and then, you know, um, itself was born. And now we um, have got this fantastic new AI discovery engine, which allows researchers to mimic the way the human mind works to um, to find um, uh, concept based um, discovery rather than keyword based discovery. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how we do that. Now, the way that you know works is that we have um, created a search engine which is very much built on um, inferences. So what we do is that we have ingested over 200 million full text articles from publishers and, and as well as government documents, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what the engine actually does, it begins to extract meaning, colorate, aggregate, analyze, visualize, and it consistently does the same thing. So we can build inferences between, uh, between these concepts. And as you can see, this is how we identify, um, for example, the difference between apple a computer and apple a fruit, for example. And this really is very, very powerful, um, powerful technology. 
and we use this um, framework um, through AI using three um, three areas in artificial intelligence, which is um, computational semantics, graph theory, and machine learning, which enables us to identify and extract concepts from unstructured and structured data, and then to uncover significant knowledge via inferential chain of connections across those concepts. So this is what we've built through this AI. And what we want to do is then also think about how we, what, uh, how we identify what a concept is. And from our perspective, a concept is an abstraction of an idea, a thought or an expression portrayed in various forms. So here, for example, because the machine has read um, here the, um, uh, the example of Jaguar, we have identified here that Jaguar is actually a luxury vehicle because it has um, because, because of the context that it's in. So here you can see it's a luxury vehicle um, by Land Rover, owned by an English uh, owned by an Indian company, Tata. Um, since 2008. The same thing goes for democracy here, the same thing goes for quantitative easing. So that's how, for example, with Jaguar, we have determined between it being a luxury vehicle and a cat, just to give you an example of that. And this is really uh, important for us to know because um, uh, the, we believe that concepts are atomic units of knowledge. That's very, very important for us, and, it's, um, and this is how we really um, are able to empower researchers to go beyond just using the discovery tools, which don't necessarily tell you the difference between, um, you know, for example, Jaguar a fruit or Jaguar, oh, sorry, Jaguar a cat or Jaguar a, um, a luxury vehicle. If you looked something like that up within a discovery tool, it wouldn't be the most helpful thing. The usual discovery tool, the, the discovery tools that we have now on the market are brilliant for um, known item searching, as well as finding information um, by an author or a journal publication or an article that you know of. But actually to go beyond and, and have something more where you can hypothesize, um, we don't have anything that does that to us. So here we have um, just some more examples of what I was talking about here. We really want to go beyond um, uh, keywords and really get to the nitty gritty about, uh, about concepts and show the relationships that are within them. So therefore, we have built this engine, uh, which mimics, um, um, which uses a neural network model, mimicking the way the human brain works. So we have ingested over 200 million full text articles from our publishing partners. We have um, put that into our um, uh, um, search engine, and the um, machine will read, understand, and create concepts and inferences based on what it has written, mimicking the way the human mind does. So this is. These are the two tools we've built. We've built something called Uno Discover, which is for academic and state libraries, and Uno Unearth, which is specifically for um, uh, content creators, publishers, and distributors um, to get a more deeper understanding of their own content and what that really is about. So I'll just start with Uno Discover first. Um, Uno Discover is a really good place for um, students, maybe in their first or second year, and they want to. Um, or maybe they don't even know what the keywords are because this is something that I know from quite a lot of librarians that um, students really struggle to find things in the library because they don't really know necessarily what the keywords are. So if they want to get a simple, if they have the simple question and want a straight answer, or they want to begin an essay plan, uh, you know, Discover is a really good tool to enable them to do that. However, you could be a second year PhD student and you really want an area where you can hypothesize um, and see what else has been written about certain subjects or you have actually a gut instinct about something and you want to see if anything has, has actually been written about it, then um, you know, Discover is a really good way to um, really ask more open-ended questions and um, really get more information about complex um, questions with answers that you might be looking for. So what I'm going to do now is go straight into full screen sharing, can um, show you a little bit about how this actually works. Now, the good thing and the good thing about Uno Discover is that it plugs into your uh, um, uh, keyword-based search engine. So this works together with um, uh, Primo and Episode Discovery and Theme Solutions, et cetera, et cetera. We have provided plugins through uh, widgets and things like that for your uh, discovery tool, widgets that can be put anywhere on LibGuides or anywhere on your library page where you think people are trying to get access to information. 
So um, in terms of input, this is a very simple way to um, um, utilize, uh, you know, that's for sure. It's a cloud-based service as well, so there's very, very little um, need for um, integration at, um, at a library's end. So what I'm going to do now is just give you an example of how, um, how, how we can get a much uh, deeper level of disambiguation because of the amount of information that you know is consistent, you know, Discover is reading. So if I put in something like this, if I begin my journey here, Zika, okay, what we have um, is if just by entering um, just the word and not even Zika virus, it's asking me, what do you mean so that I can give you some more information in the topic area that you're looking for? So here we can see, do you mean Zika virus, infectious diseases, or do you mean this gentleman, Adolf Zika in television and performing arts, or perhaps Zika forest in East Africa, or the Zika rabbit, or this um, another person called uh, Zika here um, in television, a Nigerian um, a film actor, or perhaps in under infection control, again, maybe the Zika fever, or this uh, painter here, this Czech artist, or is it the outbreak? Um, you know, what is it that you're looking for so I can really show you um, more information about uh, the subject? So I say, okay, yeah, actually, I'm looking for Zika virus. So if I click on Zika virus, the tool is now reading over 200 million full text articles and it has created a useful knowledge graph here for me, which is giving me a good idea about the concepts at about 50%, which are the most related to uh, Zika, Zika virus. Now, what I could do is if I am a first year student, I could really, you know, if I'm just beginning my search, I can really reduce the number of um, concepts that I'm seeing here. And, and if I'm really more of a, you know, maybe a third or fourth year student, I can um, really expand my search items further if I so wish to. So even at 70%, these are very, very important concepts related to the virus. For the sake of the screen share here, I'm just going to leave it to about 40, 50%, as yes, you can see. And then if I hover over some of these nodes, you'll be able to see that I'm already seeing the relationships between, that there are existing relationships between other concepts within Zika virus here that I would be able to, to play around with. But just for a moment, I'm just going to move over to the left-hand side of the screen. And here you see we've been able to provide an overview of what is actually Zika virus. So here we've provided a definition of what is Zika virus, um, and we're usually these definitions, depending on the topic um, matter, we'll be able to provide anything between two and four, maybe five subject headings. These come from different places. They can come from here. This has come from medical subject heading, headings because it's more of scientific research I'm doing here. We, we would also get definitions from um, a uh, encyclopedia. Encyclopedia Britannica, Wikipedia, um, other places that we seek definitions from are um, established um, um, uh, publishers themselves as well, especially if they have been uh, pivotal in creating that definition for a certain concept. So that's where we would get the definition from um, so that you would know whether this is really what you're looking for or not. Then we have listed some concepts here, um, most pertinent concepts here, which you can, which you can see. And if we go to documents, this is where we get our academic content. This is where we get our, our um, uh, journal, uh, journal articles and books, which would be directly related to our search. So here, for example, you can see lots of um, filters here. Uh, what we do when an institution becomes a subscriber, we also provide another filter here, which allows you to um, just filter by what your institutional holdings are. Because when institutions do become subscribers, where we get a list of their holdings and we corroborate those holdings to make sure that we can drive your patrons to where you have subscriptions. And where you don't have subscriptions, people will still be able to um, look at concepts uh, which have um, documents related to them, but obviously you wouldn't be able to access them because you don't have a subscription. But here you're able to really um, uh, so filter by lots of different um, topics and document types which are um, pertinent to you and you can also add in your publication dates of your choice. Now the rankings of these, um, this uh, good thing about you know it's totally unbiased and neutral so um, there is no um, kind of um, hierarchy in, 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 in terms of publisher and whose content gets shown uh, first over others. No, this is actually completely unbiased and what you're seeing at the top is what is the most conceptually relevant to your search. So for example, if I go here to this first one, this is from the American Medical Association, and if I go in here, it's just going to now give me a quick snippet of information 
um, directly taken from the journal article itself. And as you can see, we've been able to identify a few re relevant snippets directly from this uh, journal article um, from the publisher. And we have their permission to do so, by the way. Um, and then the information here about the journal, the title, the author, ISSN reading time, and then where you could actually get this article as a researcher. So you could uh, get it from Interlibrary Loan directly from the publisher itself, or the third one would be, for example, get it from my ex university library. And there would be another button here. I, I'm, unfortunately, I have a very vanilla version because I'm not at an institution at the moment, but there would be a third button here that would say, um, find it in my university library, and then you would be taken by your link, link resolver to this um, particular journal article if that is what you have um, within your library holdings. So what I would really like to do here is just go delve deeper further into this uh, knowledge graph and really show how we can go further and, and learn more about certain subjects. So for example, um, what I'd like to see is perhaps the relationship between hepatitis C this is hepatitis C and Zika virus. So if I just click on, oh, sorry, I clicked on chigunya, uh, chigunya for example. So I want to see the relationship between chigunya and, um, and a Zika virus. And now if I click on documents, it's now changed again, and it's going to show me the relation, only those documents related to Zika virus and chikigunya virus, um, uh, chikigunya there. And I can um, go into any of these that I particularly want to, to have a look at. So here's, from, for example, from Spring of Nature. And again, it's giving me a quick snippet of information and the journal information that I would like to, um, I would like to look at. Uh, the good thing about having these snippets is that um, it takes the researcher directly to the point within the journal article that is directly relevant to their search. Because as you know, um, um, uh, abstracts do vary in quality, um, and so therefore uh, this provides a more of a um, direct way to know whether the journal article is uh, really going to be relevant to, to, your, to your research or not. And it just saves um, a lot of time for the researcher for finding things and not having to waste time reading things which may or may not be relevant to their, to their search. But what you can also do, oh, sorry, go back here to the knowledge graph. Here, what you can also do is turn any of these um, into um, primary, a, a primary, um, a primary node. So for example, if I double click on this, Marva virus. It will now redraw the knowledge graph for me after reading over 200 million full text virus, uh, full text articles. And it's now showing me the relationship between Zika virus and Marva virus and all the concepts and um, uh, concepts and the relationships between the, the three. So I've just zoomed out here a little bit for you so you can see here a little bit better. So that's Zika virus. And it's really good because you can move and map further up and down as you, as you would like. Um, so we have here Zika virus and Marburg virus. And again, if I click right in the middle of these two, I can see the relationship between Marburg virus disease and Zika virus. Again, if I go into the documents, this will now change again. And you can see, again, the, um, the snippets um, of from the documents have changed once again. So right now we have Wiley at the top um, about um, the, these two um, these two, um, the relationship between Marburg virus and Zika virus. So that's really, really good um, information for a, um, a, a, um, a researcher to have on hand. And there are lots of helpful things here. You can take a picture um, of this particular knowledge map now. And if I go to the research journey here on the left hand side, you can see that I've been pretty busy looking at lots and lots of different, different types of things. Um, and if I go down here now, you'll see that it has saved this knowledge map for me and if I want I can download this into my Google Docs for example if I want to do that and it's now going to um, and it's now going to give me a, um, um, a copy of this of this knowledge map which I which, which I can use and um, I can I've also it's now redrawn that for me here we go yeah so we have a lovely um, version of the map which I can keep and, and export and use um, anytime I like and for example here with this particular document I can download this for example maybe into a CSV file or whatever and that will download and I'll be able to um, um, keep, a, keep a, a copy of that for myself so that I can um, go and go back from Excel and have a look 
at um, the, the snippet and document information that I have pertaining to that search. But what I'm also going to do is maybe I can add something here. So not only I've been able to um, look at um, uh, creating um, primary nodes from existing nodes, but I can actually add my own nodes, for example, you know, if I put in something like this, something more general, like maybe Africa, okay, and if I just click on, so again, it's asking me, what do you mean by Africa, something within geography, Africa TV series, Africa the journal, Africa some goddess, Africa Roman province, HMS Africa, etc, etc, there's quite a lot of disambiguation here, much higher level of disambiguation you would get from than a normal discovery service, so what we will do is just click on that now, and will redraw the the, the knowledge graph one more time and now it's going to um, show me the relationship between here Zika virus Africa and Marburg virus and here as you can see there's lots of concepts in between there that I can see and um, do more research further if I so wish to and I can layer up my searches if I so wish to I can do up to four searches here so I've got lots of different hypotheses that I can come back to and review um, at a later date if I if I so wish to so that's um, you know, Discover. Um, I think it's a fun, fantastic tool for um, right at the beginning of your research career, or if you are a, a well-versed researcher, um, you know, maybe somebody working in a research institute, or even in a in a in a biotech company, for example, that may be a good example. You would really be able to um, delve deeper and go beyond just sort of a keyword-based search and just the level of disambiguation that you get. And I'm just going to show you a little bit further about uh, concepts because, you know, concepts, the good thing about, you know, is because it's consistently reading over 200 million full text articles. So archival content as well as current content as well. We know when concepts are actually evolving. So an evolving concept would be something like Brexit. OK, Brexit, what is Brexit? It's just a made up word by the media, for example. So if I just give this as an example, Brexit, if I put that in, it's already telling me well, what you really mean is this, the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union under political science and democracy. Another good thing here is like Brexit, which I didn't, I didn't know and I'd sort of forgotten about. There was actually a, um, a, um, a festival about Brexit that was planned. So it's saying to me, do you mean Brexit as in the music festival? Or do you mean here the referendum? Or do you mean Brexit in European law? Or actually, do you mean this within language and art? And this was very interesting to me because I'm a linguist. Um, so actually, you wouldn't be able to find anything about Brexit under language um, in a traditional discovery tool. It would be very, very difficult to find that unless you knew what lexicography was. And here we can see that um, um, this has provided you information about uh, Brexit under language arts um, rather than just you know political science, which is probably the most um, obvious thing but actually as a linguist you might not be looking looking at the historical um part uh, sorry the, 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 the political science behind of it so here's you can see it goes further and further asking you know even here brexit under activism the level of disambiguation that you get is is very very high and what about something for example in in popular culture look at, look at something like this sting okay what do we mean by sting well there's so many definitions look at this sting television series the sting or sting within computer information system. Here we have stinger in toxicology. Here, or we have this person here, sting the musician. So it really goes beyond. Um, here we have something in aerodynamics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, percussion, so many things. Oh, Middle Earth. Okay, brilliant. That's actually something I'd like to look at. Um, so really, really high levels of, of disambiguation. So your researchers really can get to the nitty gritty quickly within their topic area that they're looking for. So that's you know, um, you know, discover. And if you want more information, please let me know, and I'll be able to provide you much further a deep uh, demonstration about that. But I know that um, I'm trying to be careful about the time, so I really um, would like to move forward and show you a little bit more about um, you know, unearth. Okay, so you know, unearth is something that we didn't actually set set out to build uh, you know on earth it was specifically um, requested to us by uh, our um, by our publisher partners they said to us right if you're reading over 200 million full text articles perhaps you could um, enable us to get a much better hold on our own our own um, uh, content collections because we really like to understand our content better at topic, subtopic level, but also to generate the concepts that come out of um, the, um, the collections themselves. 
So here's something that we did with one of our uh, partners, MIT Press, to go through their um, collections. So what I'm going to do now is just show you an example of some of their, uh, of, of the, their book collection that we've, what we've read. So here I'm going to do a quick search on something about robotics. OK, I'm looking for a book with a title in it of robotics. So if I click here, robotics, it's now going to read the full uh, content collection. And it showed me 34 books here with um, the topic um, with the word robotics in the title. So there's some actually called robotics. And then, for example, here, if we go further, further down, there's probabilistic robotics, human robotics, um, architectural robotics, development robotics, robotics primer, etc., etc. So it showed me 34 results here. And it's also weighted them for me here as well by topic and subtopic. You can see here 53% of the 34 books are doing technology and engineering with a lot, a lot of other subtopics here that come into there. And the same thing with uh, mathematics, subtopics that um, are from mathematics. And same thing here with computers. So we can go down further as well. And then you can add different topic weights as well, if you so wish to, of your own, which don't come up. Um, and then as publishers, this is quite good. Like once you track this over a period, a period of time on the different books or, or you know, publications that you're, you're, you're looking at. So that's we have. Um, so we have all those different filters available here for you. What I'm going to do now is just go into one of these books and see which one might be interesting for me. So, for example, let's go into this one, The Horizons of Evolutionary Robotics from MIT Press. We just click on this one it's now read it for me and it's telling me okay um i have the isbn of this book the link back to the publisher page and i've also got these topics here so as you can see this book is 45 percent technology and engineering with the subtopic in robotics 30 percent life science with the subtopic in evolution and 25 percent psychology with the subtopic in cognitive science and the great thing about this um, is that because uh, we've used technology, artificial intelligence to read this book, there's absolutely no, um, no bias um, here at all. Um, you get a much, a much um, better quality metadata afterwards as well. And also, if you've got journals and books and manuscripts, um, you know, magazines or whatever, for example, you can categorize everything um, in the same way. Um, rather than doing doing different um, different types of content in, in in different ways, so that's really good for for publishers. And because it's completely unbiased, they they like that as well. And here's a quick um, uh, overview of the book that's provided by the publishers. The other thing that we've been able to do, we haven't done it here for MIT Press because this was quite a um, um, uh, this was a, a very young version of what we created but for other publishers what we've also been able to do is provide chapter level topics um, and concepts as well so i'm just going to talk a little bit about the concept so here as you can see we've sent one two three topics here one two three subtopics but look at the amount of concepts that have come out of this particular um this particular book which is excellent so here we have search algorithm natural language processing these are all concepts that we have um, that we have actually um, uh, detected, which have come out of this book. So if I go into this one, for example, NLP, natural language processing, if I open this particular um, um, concept, as you can see here, we have the snippets um, within the book um, which pertain to this particular um, this particular um, uh, this particular um, concept. Um, now we actually did this uh, for, for a historical, um, for a history-based publisher as well. And um, one of the concepts, and, and, and their book was about, um, their book was actually about um, the uh, Holocaust, etc. And one of the concepts that came out of there was uh, internment, but nowhere within the book itself was the word internment used. That was really interesting because um, they were able to really enrich their own taxonomy. Um, for, for searching, um, having known that now the concept internment come, came out of this book, but actually nowhere was the word internment used at all. Um, but what we can do here, for example, with natural language processing, now that we've understood this within this MIT book, this to be um, a concept, we could actually review this um, um, particular concept across the entire portfolio of uh, MIT Press's collection. So here we have the concept, natural language processing, and here we have 447 books with the concept, um, natural language processing. And here we have another list of books, which would be, uh, which will enable a much more granular understanding of their own, of, of um, a publisher's content, if you didn't already know um, that you had um, 
and natural language processing, for example, as a concept which has come out here. So, for example, if I go into this particular book, we should be able to see now natural language processing somewhere come up as a. Here we go, neural network. Natural language processing should come up as a. A concepts come with. Wow, there's quite a lot of concepts that come up here all together. Somewhere, just haven't been able to find it. But anyway, let's go back to the results page here. Okay, so we've identified that. The good thing about um, you know on Earth as well, we have built um, lots of different APIs, which are uh, very important for um, for publishers themselves as well. And we could use we could employ the same tech um, we could employ the same kind of technology for libraries as well. So we have APIs which will enable because we're reading over 200 million full text articles. We can also enable APIs that will um, increase the the richness of your metadata for your collections as well in the libraries. Uh, we'll be able to make calls through APIs. APIs and to really get a better understanding of topics and subtopics and uh, concepts that come out of that. For example, um, did this for Stanford University Press. One of their books was called um, Nanotechnology, and the category of that book was also nanotechnology. But we'd actually found uh, five other topics and subtopics that came out of that particular book, as well as a number of concepts. So they were able to provide a much richer taxonomy for that particular book, especially for searching and indexing in other places as well. So, um, um, you know, on Earth is really good for, for those uh, publishers that also want to uh, review manuscripts and, um, and uh, read them before publication through using our technology and then to see quickly if they would um, then fit with the rest of the portfolio that they have. Marketing could also use, you know, um, on Earth as well to um, redesign uh, collections as well. And... Um, and you could also um, uh, have this as better information. So, for example, when you go and visit a librarian, you could provide a much better list uh, of um, books that or journal collections which would be tailored to certain subject areas which you may or may not have, have known about. So that's just to give you a very, very quick um, update about what we've been doing at UNO for publishers as well as um, as um, libraries. Um, I'd be very pleased to give you um, a much deeper uh, dive into, into you know products, but um, I'm very aware of time and I know people probably might have some questions. So what I'm going to do is um, hand back over to Mike. Hello, uh, thank you very much for that Manisha. Uh, that was really interesting um, and I feel sure that the tools will be of great benefit to libraries and, publish and publishers. Um, thank you also for the participants. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, if you'd like to get in contact uh, with Ingenta, uh, please contact Byron Russell. Um, so it's byron.russell at ingenta.com. Uh, we've also got our website, uh, which is www.ingenta.com and uh, www.ingentaconnect.com. And uh, yes, we've also got the Twitter handle uh, at WeAreIngenta. Um, we will actually be running uh, a few more webinars over the coming months, so uh, please visit our event page on our website and uh, make sure you register for the ones that are coming. Uh, we hope to hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.